Um, so welcome, and uh, I'm excited to have you, and excited to kind of explore this idea of engagement in the hybrid, blended, and fully online environment. And you know, I have these questions up here uh, for uh, several different reasons. One, these are the types of questions uh, that I've heard a number of educators ask me, uh, my colleagues here at the University of Kansas, uh, K-12 teachers I've been working with face-to-face, -face. questions we are getting during the pandemic. I mentioned school virtually. Uh, oh, and by the way, let me make sure I do this before we get any further. Uh, as um, Sarah mentioned, uh, we have this, uh, available via uh, Schoology, but I am also gonna pop this into the, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second, sorry. I'm gonna pop this into the chat. So if you need this, um, oh, how could I, uh, Sarah, I'm gonna let you I, I, it. Yeah, I, I dropped Perfect. it in, uh, Dr. Smith. My apologies, oh, so sorry. I had done that last time and sorry guys, we'll get started here and we'll have a little bit better flow. Okay, so these are questions that um, popped up and to me, they're, they're, they're relevant, but yet they're not relevant. That is, gosh, Sean, what's the best digital tool to use for engagement? Well, good question, but I'd like to kind of refocus it to how do we engage the learner and what tools will better facilitate that engagement? Or gosh, the students aren't turning the camera on, or the students aren't being, seem to be motivated, or I can't seem to get the student to complete what we're asking them to complete. And yes, those are kind of engagement issues, but to me, those are planning and design solutions. Those are planning and design issues that need a planning and design solution. And so the way I look at facilitating engagement might be a little odd, or not necessarily odd, but a little different the way that some folks immediately are asking the questions. Like for example, I have several suggestions to get the camera on, but they aren't necessarily kind of recruiting interest. It's more how do we plan, design, what's the purpose, what are we gonna use the camera for, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of how I'm gonna take this next hour in our exploration. Feel free as you go along here to um, uh, take note. Uh, if you wanna email me, and I already saw some emails come to me um, during our, our brief break, I saw several people email me some questions for clarification. Now again, resource-wise, remember Sarah shared this with you, but also the Schoology site has the folder for these presentations, as well as I have a special, a, a specific link that I've created several pages to go along with this presentation on resources that would align with these things. So FYI. Um, oh, and before I forget, for those of us, gosh, Sean, we're really looking for some digital tools to facilitate this. There's a great article that I've linked to that literally lists all these digital tools that sitting in that Google folder by a colleague of mine at the University of Hawaii, a good friend, Kavita Rao, and Kavita, uh, a colleague of hers, looked at all the Google Chrome apps, aligning them to Universal Design for Learning, something I'll be talking about again, and also students with disabilities. So FYI, those resources are there as well. All right, but feel free also, as I'm talking about some of these things, try to connect them to your reality. I can't contextualize everything. We're talking about the entire Commonwealth. We're talking about across uh, lots of different educators and lots of different backgrounds, okay? Oh, and by the way, I did mention this in the, uh, the opening session um, in terms of we're talking about the Commonwealth. Uh, so I grew up just north of you folks. I grew up in upstate New York, uh, Canandaigua, which is just south of uh, Rochester. It's one of the Finger Lakes. Uh, and so th it's the time to be there is right now on the lake, uh, sadly, uh, a lot of family in Auburn, which is on a Wasco Lake, but uh, we're so far away. So I'm here in the Midwest, but uh, definitely an Easterner at heart and uh, the perspective of an Easterner, uh, at least a, a New Yorker, or an upstate New Yorker, I should say, but um, family in the Scranton area and uh, Hershey area. And anyways, I, I, I definitely uh, am familiar with Pennsylvania. So we'll leave it there. Okay. so. When we think about engagement oftentimes, or some of us will think about the fact that, yes, the student's there. Yes, the student's ready. The hands are raised. They're smiling. They want to be connected with us. Yes, that's an engaged environment. And okay, okay. Uh, I'm not sure how many times I've actually experienced that. And honestly, uh, going forward, if we're going to be environments face-to-face, -face, most likely we'll be in masks. Uh, and at least I hope we will be because of, of course, the safety there. And I can tell you, having now presented to educators in mass, and I've done probably a dozen of these uh, since May, 
Uh, it is a different experience in that uh, trying to see the level of facial connection that, that you're looking for that kind of guidance there at times when we're trying to see do you understand the different things uh, that's lost now because they're covered you're only going to see their eyes so it's another way of thinking about how we're going to engage and facilitate that so you know when we think about that of course online we think engagement oftentimes is their headphones on their cameras on they're ready to go hopefully they don't need to be wearing that mask i just thought it was kind of a, a funny picture but uh again you know is that engagement uh, based on what we're trying to design and plan for? And so kind of be thinking about that. And then finally, of course, oftentimes when we think of this online, when I hear educators talk to me and then myself included, of course they're ready. They have their pencils and pens. Of course they have their books ready. Of course they're signed into the right lesson. Of course they understand where they're supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And better yet, you know, the adult in the home, mom or dad are there. Uh, you know, and, and, and so uh, they're there ready to go uh, and facilitate, but that's not the reality. That's not something that we can expect of students with disabilities with their executive function challenges, right? Uh, I don't know why, my mouse is just not working. I apologize, folks. I'm trying to use my uh, keyboard and it's just not wanting to cooperate. So I apologize for that ding, ding, ding. But the, 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 the beauty of having a parent with them side by side is very unlikely especially as folks are having to work and, and we don't have to socially isolate the way we did during the pandemic, or we're still during the pandemic, but during the spring. But one of the things that to me is good news, but also potentially bad news, is that while we want a level of engagement, there is no magic pill. Uh, but there's ways to doing things, but there's no, oh gosh, one person's doing it, and let's find out what that solution is and we'll be golden, or I'm not doing it, but someone's got it figured out, darn it all, we're not there. Okay, but we do know that there are some maps, there are some ways to facilitate and give us some direction of where we're going. And I wanna help us kind of understand and appreciate some of those elements and, and, and bring them into our planning and bring them into our reality. So with that said, let's go kind of move along here. And of course, just one more reinforcer to us, we know if we can get high attention and high commitment, we're gonna go along with engagement. We know if we can uh, develop grit in the individual, uh, there's gonna be a level of perseverance. There's gonna be a level of self-determination in the vocabulary of students with disabilities uh, to make that connection. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that self-determination area, it's been going on for decades now, very big, strong connection in empowering our individuals with disabilities in a very explicit manner, in a very specific manner. All right. So to do this kind of analysis and get us thinking about it, I want to take a bit of a step back. And so I want to be thinking about engagement, but I want to step back a little bit and think about well, what are our expectations and how we're designing and planning. And you may say, well, what does Larry Bird and Magic Johnson have to do with step back? Well, step back, you know, Steph Curry, when he steps back and hits that jumper, those of us that don't know Steph Curry, forget about the example, but it's a jumper, you're stepping back, and I'm old school and love Larry Bird. Okay, uh, anyways, when we step back and we think about how we're designing and planning, how are we facilitating that level of self-regulation, that empowerment of the individual, that self-determination? How are we connecting engagement with digital tools? How are we doing that very purposefully? And that's what I want to kind of explore together. And so to begin with, how are we designing the instruction for the hybrid, but also the face-to-face -face, or maybe temporarily fully online? So let's go with the fully online for a moment. In the fully online prior to the pandemic, a number of fully online classes, elementary, middle, secondary, they would look at the instructional day as an instructional week. And oftentimes what they would do is educators would facilitate this idea of Here's a series of experiences we want to facilitate for this coming week. Here are a series of lessons, et cetera, et cetera. And so by organizing it across the week, the educator would then be able to offer supports Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Now, by the way, most fully online learning prior to the pandemic was not Zoom classes every single day. It wasn't. It was instead, okay, Here's how I've designed some independent experiences. Here's how I designed some small group. There might be some large group. 
There might be some office hours with the mother and father, the grandma, grandpa to problem solve a little bit. But it also, by designing the week, they allowed the individual family to work with on their circumstances. So maybe mom's on ship work and mom can't be available until this time when it's really critical to be there for an hour to facilitate an element of instruction where maybe there's another half hour, two hours, et cetera, the child can be somewhat independent when it's chunked appropriately. So that way, by designing for the week and saying this needs to be done by Friday, that level of engagement might be enhanced due to that flexibility. But by the way, we just simply don't say it's due, but then we offer that timely inter intervention, that additional support, which honestly, across our students, it might be more needed for some rather than others, depending upon one, what supports they have at home, their abilities, the list goes on. So I'm not saying we have to do that, but it's a way of designing for that, the defining parameters of fully online. Now in the hybrid blended, I'd still say that flexibility needs to be there because there is a level of support that may be necessary for the individual based on obligations at home, the demands at home, the support or lack of support, et cetera. But also design beyond that, could come into the idea of how am I designing back to UDL? Am I offering multiple options to be able to access representation of information? I better just not simply give digital text, a lot of barriers. What video am I offering? How, when, images, uh, uh, comics, uh, webs, a variety of other resources. How am I scaffolding and embedding supports in those scaffolds? And we're gonna talk about embedded supports I'll give a brief example with Google Slides and Google Classroom in general. But also, are we being strategic about building up that executive function skills? I think that's critical in our hybrid blended fully online. We need to actually uh, separate some time where the students are actually starting to develop some of those skills because that's an expectation of ours. We better be more explicit there. Now, there may be, wait, 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 time away from content, Sean? Well, this could be some things we do more independently and the student does in the blended hybrid or that fully online component. Now, also in terms of designing, it might be the fact that when and how are we gonna use these video models that I talked about in the keynote? What are we gonna to try to illustrate? For what purpose? And by the way, for whom? And I can't emphasize this enough. When I think of video models, K-12, I think of two stakeholders, the student I'm involved with and the adult in the home. We're designing for both, and we need to be thinking about that. I'll give my own personal example. This is a six or seven year old example. My son, JJ, who's about to start his freshman year in college, has major attention issues. He was actually calling me to problem solve something, you know, from afar. I think I'm, it's good to get those calls, but I think I'm gonna get more of them. Anyways, sixth grade math, start of middle school. The teacher decided, to create a, a variety of video models and put them on to a learning management system called Blackboard. And the purpose of this was simply to provide examples of what she was doing in class to give supports to her students. And I think she had a variety of students, I think it was 120 students she was trying to serve. And she also saw this as a way to maximize some of her efficiency. Well, I looked at those and said, golden, because they were doing some sort of Hawaiian math. I have no clue what it was, but it was very different the way I was instructed. And so I'm watching some of the videos, not to teach JJ, but rather as a parent, I'm trying to support his homework. And so I'm watching some of these. So when he comes to me and says, I'm having difficulty with this problem, I understand how to explain it to him. So I was using this for my benefit, but of course I was also telling JJ, hey, Mrs. C explains this quite well in the video, you go watch it. But be mindful, be thinking about that. For our kindergarten, first, second, third grade parents, we may be making these video models more for the parent than for the child, not to add on to their shoulders, but rather to help facilitate and further empower. Now, they also could be directions and instructions. I'll give you an example of that in a few minutes here. But those are the types of things. It could be the use of checklists. I'll talk about those but it's designing for that synchronous, designing for the asynchronous in a very purposeful manner. And by doing so, we will enhance that level of engagement. We will reduce barriers that might get in the way for that lack of motivation, that lack of connection. And again, 
This is all going to be reinforced here in just a moment. So let's go with a couple technologies to kind of illustrate. Google Classroom, think of Google Classroom, right? So inside Google Slides, Google Docs, Google Sheets, Forms, et cetera, I can offer in comments. I can embed elements inside cells, inside the doc, inside slides. Let's use slides for an example. Let's say I want students to work somewhat independently or maybe in a small group, but from a hybrid perspective. And I wanna make sure that I'm giving them prompts. I'm giving them directions. I'm giving them step-to-step -step elements that I would normally do face-to-face, -face, but I'm not available. Well, each slide, I could create a template. And by the way, if I create this template in Google, Do in, in Google Classroom, the student automatically opens it up. They don't even need to make a copy of it if it's created the right way. And then they can go and manipulate it with my structure. And by the way, my structure is not simply a type here type of thing, but rather my structure is I have a little audio note that I explain my verbal directions inside that slide that that student can click and listen to. I could embed a video where I'm giving some illustrations. I'm giving an example. The list goes on. I could put in comments highlighted about what I want for this. So directions, prompts, guidance. And then of course, as they're creating it, I can get online and give feedback. I can give further examples. And for the student, when they're done listening to my notes or my, excuse me, my um, audio notes, or the video, they can click on delete it and then they'll have their slide themselves. These are the types of things you don't need to do it in Google Slides. Use the other tools you have that allow you to do this. This will reduce the barriers, reduce the questions. It will help lead them to be more independent, more engaged, allow them to self-regulate. And again, depending upon the age of the child and what you're expecting, it would differ with the tool. All right, now you may have to do, well, more hands-on in terms of video conferencing with certain ages, uh, depending upon the individual, but anyways, there's an example. Another example, oh, by the way, here's some resources. Uh, I've given you a video as well as three web pages that talk about Google Slides to be used collaboratively. Uh, Google Slides, uh, because of course, we're gonna talk about this uh, here in, in, in a few minutes, but let me just reinforce it now. We know in Google, slides as well as Google Docs, et cetera, we can all be online together and be manipulating this all at the same time. And so it's a great collaborative tool as well, let alone a tool that has embedded supports and examples and things of that nature. All right, so that's just a tool and resource for you um, once you get to the slides. You know, another, as we've talked about with the video and we talked about this in the keynote, is the use of uh, a screencasting uh, tool and Screencastify is a, a Chrome app. I use a program that's for pay called Camtasia, and there's others, and I have links to these on that resource guide I told you about in our folder. But this is allowing us to capture and videotape our screen and basically allow the educator, the teacher, to talk directly to the student when they're not there, so asynchronous, as well as potentially to the parent or the adult in the home. So here we go. This is one where she created this because basically she was going to be a sub. Uh, there was going to be a sub, and so she wanted to review some things with her students. Oops. So let's go ahead and watch this real quick. You're adding ideas, putting a definition in your own words, and making sure that there are some images that will help you remember the word. So go ahead and pause this video, and 15 minutes you have to work on vocab. So she's actually giving directions. And then she's actually telling you to pause, do your work, and then come back in, and she'll give more information. I'm going to catch you guys up on a few plot updates in Fahrenheit 451. So this is a great way of utilizing her screencasting. And by the way, she screencasted herself. That wasn't necessary because she was really trying to illustrate her desktop and what the students would see on Google Classroom or wherever they were to access this information but she's giving very explicit instructions. Students could click and rewind, watch it again. And by the way, since it's in YouTube, you can actually slow down a YouTube video to make it go even slower. Of course, they can rewind it, they can stop it, uh, they can uh, enhance it. All those elements are available to them to better understand. Now, another way to engage to me is checklist, checklist, and checklist. There's a book called The Checklist Manifesto. 
and it's a, not geared towards teachers, but it talks about the power of checklists for us as, as, as humans. And to me, as an educator, I can create a checklist to describe how to do something and give very explicit steps. I could put visuals with that checklist. I could create it as a digital checklist where it's somewhat interactive. Hey, when I'm done, I, I get to click on it. It clicks on it, it shows it's done. And by the way, that in and of itself for some of our learners, huge, right? The fact that I've got something done, it's done. I could create a checklist when I click on it, it disappears. Oh, my checklist has now gotten smaller. But I could also offer what I'm looking for. You know, what's the characteristics of an effective learning math? Or I could describe what teachers need to do, what the student needs to do, what the adult in the home needs to do. I could do it where it's visual, like in Google Chrome, it could just be a bunch of images, excuse me, in um, Google Form. It could be just a bunch of images with some check boxes. It could be something that's a uh, uh, step-by-step sequence, a host of other things. It could have audio prompts, but checklists are powerful for a level of engagement because I'm understanding, first of all, what I need to do. It's offered in an order sequence, really, really helpful. It's visual, really helpful. It allows me to know that I'm done, yay, but also help through those transitions, right? I mean, how many students of children with autism we've worked with where our visual schedules not only need to show the beginning and the middle, but we need to show that we've ended because that's just as critical for the individual to know, good, I've accomplished it, now I'm ready to transition to the next thing. I could go on and on about checklists, very powerful. Now, a couple other things to be thinking about very directly is when I'm teaching face-to-face, -face, what is it that I'm going to select that really maximizes my time and what I'm doing, but also maximizes the uh, level of engagement. So for example, direct instruction may be critical face-to-face. -face. I have to assess face-to-face. -face. I have to facilitate things through small group. Okay, in hybrid then, excuse me, in the online or hybrid, then I'm going to make sure we do drill and practice. I'm not going to spend time, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not going to spend time, spend, if I have limited face-to-face -face time, having students actually go um, uh, drill and practice during that time seems very, very limiting. So instead, I'm going to facilitate that uh, online. So in face-to-face, -face, I can maximize what I do instructionally. Um, so these are things I design around and plan around to maximize that level of engagement. Okay, so with that said, uh, a couple of things, well, that's all right, that's just a review. I haven't emphasized this enough, but I do want to illustrate it now, and that is planning and designing also is planning and designing around barriers. See, if we haven't designed properly and there are barriers, barriers because I'm not there, barriers because I can't prompt, barriers because I haven't given the directions complete enough, barriers because some of the technology we're using is now actually creating more of a challenge or some of the material I'm using is creating a challenge. I'm gonna disengage, barrier disengagement, barrier disengagement, the list goes on. And so some things to consider in respect to barriers. First of all, we, do, we know barriers disengage learners. We know that with enough of these, why am I motivated? I'm not, okay? I'm smart enough to know, you know, I put two and two here together and I'm gonna get disengaged due to the fact of previous experience uh, with some of these barriers. You know, I can't do it, so what, what, I'm not gonna even try, all right? It doesn't take me too many I can't do it to stop trying. And that lack of confidence, and then therefore that limited independent work, all those things are aligned. So these are things we can design and plan around and also use some of our digital tools to better facilitate. Well, what do I mean by some of our digital tools? Well, first of all, I'm gonna conceptualize these within Universal Design for Learning again. And you're like, again, Sean? Well, let me just share with you how UDL helps with engagement, and I'm gonna give you some digital tool examples. Because this is kind of that roadmap, that map, so to speak, and I wanna focus in on the green. And of course, the green has those three areas, and basically, initially, we're doing the pedaling, then, of course, we want the student to do the pedaling, with some assistance, and of course, we wanna be independent. Now, I'm offering these to you as a reinforcer because, again, there's three steps. We recruit, we do a lot of the recruitment, we wanna sustain, and then, of course, we want them to self-regulate. But, folks, the reason I'm mentioning this here, and the reason I'm giving you this example, 
and I want to get ahead of myself here, and I'll get back in just a second, is that the UDL framework, it's not just simply saying this is what we need to do, but the UDL framework, and this is hyperlinked from your presentation, the UDL framework offers examples of how to do it. So for example, how do you optimize individual choice and auto autonomy? There's a, I don't know, seven or eight different ideas to do it. Let's go back here. How do I minimize threats and distractions? Oh, here's another dozen things to think about, okay? So these aren't all encompassing. These aren't, oh my gosh, everything I need to know. But what the framework has done is, first of all, it said, hey, this needs to be incremental, recruit interest, sustain effort, and then thirdly, you're gonna self-regulate. And by the way, here are ways, we wanna foster collaboration in a community, here are ways to think about it. So I had this hyperlink off the presentation for you guys to further contextualize as a resource. Now with that said, I've also tried to take the UDL framework that talks specifically about engagement and I grabbed 10 rules for engagement that uh, some educators have created to further facilitate this. So again, I'm gonna plan and design accordingly. I'm gonna also use different frameworks to give me a map of how to do some of this level of engagement. And of course, I'll connect the digital tools that are appropriate, and I'll get to that in just a moment. So let's just take a look at these top 10. Number one, I'm gonna make sure that the child knows, especially the child that's working away from me, what my goal is. What's the goal? What are we trying to do? Where are we trying to get? Why are we trying to get there? I'm gonna visualize that. I'm gonna make sure that they understand it. I'm gonna offer that in a variety of ways. And by the way, mom and dad, grandma, grandpa, they're gonna understand that too. So they can also contextualize it. They can further translate it. And then they can also, with my experiences, I can connect, hey, this is the goal, this is why we're doing X. This is why we're doing Y, further engagement. I'm gonna minimize distractions. And by the way, those home distractions, Maybe out of my control, I'm going to talk a little bit about that parent empowerment in just a bit. I'm going to prevent, uh, present flexible assessment options, and I'm going to tie that back to number one. So I know what the goals are, and I'm going to tie the assessments back to those goals so the students see the connection as well, and then they're going to have some opportunities. And we'll talk more about assessments if you join me in the last session on assessment. I'm also, the last session, I'm going to talk more about formative feedback and giving that frequent formative feedback. I'm reminded of this constantly with the educators I teach. So I teach a number of current teachers. I also teach undergraduates that wanna be teachers. Awesome. But current teachers are just like their students. And that is, we turn something in, we want feedback and we want it pretty immediately. You know, I turned it in 24 hours ago, Sean, where's the feedback? Well, that's rewarding, it reinforces, it's engaging. It connects with what I've done with my energy. We wanna do this. And by the way, we may be saying, oh my gosh, how do I do all that with everything I've got going on? This is where digital tools that offer some automaticity in grading, my goodness, wouldn't that be awesome to use some of those tools in addition to my feedback to allow for that immediacy. And again, I'll talk more about that in the last session if you join me there. Um, of course, we want authentic and relevant examples that they can connect with. We want to make sure that there are a variety of options so we're not demanding too much with what we give material-wise, non-examples, examples, things of that nature. So these are all tips that are generic, separate from blended uh, hy uh, hybrid fully online. But if we connect them to digital solutions and use them in those environments, we might maximize our way. So how do we do that, Sean? Well, here's a couple examples, okay? So first of all, barrier-wise, to make sure that you can connect with the options of the reading that we're asking, even if it's decoding words and phonological awareness beginning in our early primary grades, we should be, if it's print, excuse me, if it's digital print, we should be using, or digital text, I should say, we should be using the tools that are out there that are sitting on our machines that our students can use to explore for that independent, that practice, the prompting, the audio, things that we won't necessarily be able to do because they're fully online or they're hybrid or blended. So text-to-speech comes in lots of shapes and sizes. There's read-write, there's 
Learning Ally, there's Snap and Read. These are all text-to-speech tools with various strengths. There's Bookshare. For those of us that are familiar with it, if I have a child with a reading disability, I better sign them up for it. Over 800,000 digital texts for that child to access, use, et cetera. So definitely. Now, let's take a look at Read Write. Now, Read Write is one of many speech, uh, text-to-speech tools, and it has a Chrome app component. It also is separate from the Chrome app, but it has a Chrome app component for those folks that want to use it in that manner. And the benefit there, and I'll offer an illustration in just a moment, but the benefit there is that when I'm opening up my website, open up my digital text, open up my Google Doc for directions, open up my Google Classroom, that bar will be there for me to basically highlight text and it will read it. So it highlights the text, it reads it out loud, it can change voices, it can change speed, it can change color, all those elements are there for me. That's basic tech-to-speech, tech but it also offers more than that. So let me show you a video. Now, uh, I'm not sure who is, uh, if it's Libby or whoever is doing the transcribing, but I wanted to emphasize one of the reasons I'm doing it with this video, there's a link to it. You can bring over to closed caption at your leisure. The other thing in YouTube, as I mentioned earlier, you can slow YouTube down. You can speed it up as well, but you can slow it down to be able to take a look at this. And the reason I'm giving the link to the um, YouTube is that at your leisure, you can take a look at this as well. So let's go ahead and listen to this real quick. Uh, and this talks about how we can um, use the same text-to-speech tool, besides just simply listening to the text, we can also do it from a um, uh, collecting highlights and annotating information. So here we go. Oh, I'm not sure why it's doing that. There we go. This video shows how to use the highlighters in Read and Write for Google Chrome to do research and extract key information from docs and websites. The highlighters on the Read and Write toolbar can be used on the web to identify key information as you're reading. To use, just select some text and click a highlighter button. Your highlights can be extracted into a new Google Doc using the Collect Highlights button. Just choose which colors you want to include and how to sort them and click OK. This will automatically generate a new doc in your Google Drive containing your highlights as well as a link back to the original source. You can also collect highlights the same way from a Google Doc. To learn more about Read and Write, visit texthelp.com so from a perspective of engagement, now I'm giving a tool that first of all will highlight and read text to me, give me a little level of independence. It allows me to control my pace. It allows me to change my voice. Put my headphones on, I have a little more control. And I can tell you I've worked with tons and tons of children with reading challenges that like that independence. Uh, now with that, I can also use the same tool to now highlight and automatically it will grab it and put it into a Google Doc for me, and it will organize it in that manner. Oh, how nifty is that? Again, I wanna be engaged in that respect. I've got a tool to make it even easier. Now, this tool also allows me to do it for vocabulary. Here we go again. This video demonstrates how to use the vocabulary tool in Read and Write for Google Chrome. The vocab feature allows you to create a vocabulary list from individual words or terms. To use in a Google Doc, just use the colored highlighters to highlight individual vocabulary words. Then click the vocab button. This will automatically create a new doc in your Google Drive containing a vocabulary chart. It includes dictionary definitions, images from the picture dictionary, and an extra column for notes. This doc can now be easily customized for your individual use or even shared with students. The vocab tool also works the same way on websites. To learn more about Read and Write for Google Chrome, visit texthelp.com. Now the beauty of this tool as well, for my purposes, 
is not only everything we've mentioned, but also the fact that it turns it into a Google Doc. And by the way, if I don't look like the sun and those teardrops or the, the raindrops, I can select that, delete it. It's a Google Doc and put in my own image. I can alter the text. I can add in text. It's a Google Doc. I can do what I'd like with it. And of course, it's shareable and everyone can be utilizing it. Uh, so anyways, these are things that take it beyond just simply a basic tool to a level of independence and self-determination, which will enhance engagement in our learners. Now, I can't talk about engagement without talking about how we empower our parents. And I do believe this coming academic year will be, honestly, for parents of children with disabilities and for children with disabilities, a very positive year in one way. And that is, we are now going to be more interactive with that home environment and be looking to be more uh, purposeful in how we engage that home environment. And I know there's challenges. I know some home environments, great to be engaged. Others, it's really hard, et cetera. But where I'm going with this is the fact that there's ways to support our parents to extend some of the learning, to reinforce some of the learning, and more importantly, to engage our learners. And so I can't reinforce this enough. And I'm not talking about adding a bunch of responsibility on parents that are already busy with work, home obligations, other children, et cetera. Well, here, let me try to illustrate. So to begin with, of course, uh, we're looking to parents, we're looking to the adult in the home to help facilitate some of these skills of distraction and attention and prioritizing and task structuring that normally we would have already in the school environment, but we need to foster that more in the home environment. So it's not direct instruction, it's not direct tutoring or things of that nature, it's a little bit more global, but yet critical to facilitate a level of engagement. Let me give you some examples. So with that said, let's think of the room. Let's think of our overall classroom. Now, in this picture here, I'm not particularly high on those lights, pretty boring lights. Uh, and I don't know about those desks, okay? I do like the natural light coming in, but why I share this picture with you is I know you as classroom experts, as teachers, you're dealing with the parameters of your classroom. And then with your expert knowledge, you've organized this, the, the desks with the limitations they've been providing you in a certain manner. You're utilizing a light in a certain manner. You're gonna utilize the board. You're gonna put things on the wall in a certain manner, in a purposeful way to enhance attention, reduce distraction, increase understanding, facilitate knowledge development allow for skill application. These are all things you're gonna do based on how you structure your environment, plus of course your instruction, right? I mean, you know that. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of a, a silly example I learned the hard way as a new special education teacher at a high school. So I came in, first year teaching special education, oh, excuse me, second year teaching special education, first year in this new building, and they just renovated the building, and unbeknownst to me, I was actually in a former custodial closet, but I didn't know it was a, it was a fairly large, small room, so to speak. Uh, I had a group of, uh, I think, uh, seven or eight students that I would work with at one time. They would come in to me and we'd do direct resource type of support. So I had enough room for them. Very high ceilings, no windows, but the high ceilings had big walls. So if some of us remember Blockbuster video, so I went down to the local Blockbuster video and said, hey, do you have old posters of movies? I'm going to put them around these open walls. Now, I also want to put up some vocabulary things and some visual schedules and some other reinforcers, but I had a lot of wall space. So I spent one Saturday putting up these posters, and I brought in a step ladder, and I'm, I'm talking about those are really high ceiling. Uh, anyways, uh, I thought I did a great job. You know, this is awesome. You can look around, cool things to see. And of course, Gosh, I think it took, it took me, because I'm a slow learner, about three weeks to realize, oh, distraction city. And so those posters, I thought, that were so cool, and it was going to be, you know, it was like one of my veteran teachers came in, because I was talking about they're not doing this, they're not doing that. She came in, saw the posters, and said, Sean, and then, of course, two and two equals four. We need to be that veteran teacher. We need to be that guide to avoid what Sean did at the home environment. So we're experts in the school environment, so how do we facilitate in the home? Well, one area we could do is furniture. No, 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 I'm not talking about 
getting them furniture, but helping them understand that that nice, safe, cozy beanbag chair might not be appropriate for that initial instruction or that couch or the bed that they've used for homework for years isn't gonna be necessarily appropriate for that initial hybrid blended learning instruction that is so critical for what we need to do, uh, un un unlike the homework in the past. And so in that, it might be the fact that we need to help them with understanding that that, that table in the kitchen, we need to make sure that table is clean and everything that's non-education related comes off it. Well, where do you put it, Sean? Well, gosh, maybe we get some 50 cent Tupperware containers at Walmart, not Tupperware, but the, the even cheaper kind. And we suggest that they put the folders in for the learning inside those containers. They put them somewhere in the kitchen where they can stack them up. And then when it comes to learning, they take the napkin holder, they take all the placeholders, the silverware, and put them off into a cupboard. And then they bring out those containers, open up those containers. There's the materials for learning. They do their learning time for lunch. They put everything back in the containers, put them off to a side. I mean, as simple as that could be an element to allow for more organization, less distraction, the list of things goes on. Now, furniture just things starts things. And by the way, maybe the more appropriate chair. So maybe it's that dining room chair, et cetera. Walls. Now, I'm not asking us to take down family pictures and, and recreate our walls and wallpaper. Et no, no, no. But we know in our classroom, we use our walls very purposefully. There's the alphabet chart. There's the math facts. There's the six traits. Now, we could create those, by the way, digitally and allow them to print it out. If we think it's really critical, we could send those things home. Uh, and I know a lot during the remote learning, a lot of people were sending those things home or dropping them off, et cetera, et cetera. But where I'm going with this is it might be on cardboard. It might be on some handouts that they put out in front of them. It might be some things they open up in their windows uh, on their computer if they have the space. It might be some things that we suggest open, if you're in the kitchen, open up your kitchen cabinet and on the inside of the kitchen cabinet, uh, paste these. And so when the student starts to learn, you open up the kitchen cabinet and on the inside doors, there they are. When you're done with learning, you close the kitchen cabinets. Now, if inside the kitchen cabinet's too distracting, then put it on the, uh, on the outside. But anyway, something that could facilitate that use the way we normally would in the classroom. And again, it could be on cardboard that we simply pull out from underneath the sofa and they take a look at it during the day and then they put it back underneath the sofa uh, in the evening. But we need to provide that. We need to give tips. We need to talk about ways to enhance uh, attention, declutter to reduce distraction, um, ways to use resources that we have, uh, maybe taking pictures of things that we'd suggest. Um, and uh, the list goes on. But this is a way to empower the parent to allow for that child to be uh, less distracted and enhance their uh, focus. So for example, it could be about the fact that here's a proposed schedule for the day, or when you're scheduling the day and you've utilized your times, this is a structure we'd suggest following. Exercise first, then follow it with the following, et cetera, et cetera. Lighting, make sure it's as natural as possible, but if it's next to an open window and the street is right there and distracted by it, then close the window and use more artificial lighting instead of the natural lighting because of the distraction. The list of things goes on. Things that we have learned about through our own experience. Things that we realized and when the window is open and it's outside the playground, nope, we need to close that window and close the shades. Things that parents may not take as a consideration, we can offer simple things. Now, other simple things could be the pets. Most of us have some sort of pet, and actually pet adoption has really gone sky high, so maybe we have some new pets, some new motivators in the household. I'm sorry, but during learning, you know, our dog named Arthur, he heads to the laundry room. He doesn't particularly like the laundry room, but his kennel is okay, so he gets in there, he takes a nap. So maybe it's bringing in their favorite pillow and closing the door, but during the academic day, the dog's not there at their feet. It's too easily distracted, or the cats are off to a separate area. Now, by the way, you could structure part of your day around feeding the animal as a reward, taking them outside as a reward, playing with them as a reward, et cetera, et cetera. In addition to pets, think about simple things. Turn off the Wi-Fi. What, Sean, turn off the Wi-Fi? How do they get their information? They can download it and then work on that material 
and then turn it back on to upload the material. You can work in Google Slides, Google Docs, and things of that nature offline, and when you turn on the internet again, it automatically replaces it. With your own phone, you can actually turn on or turn off cellular service with a click of a with a click of your thumb. Uh, so your child that is easily distracted by the phone, they have it, but it's no longer a cell phone uh, during the time. They can use it for a calculator and other things, but no access to the Wi-Fi uh, or the cellular service. So these are things that we need to be thoughtful of depending upon the child and the distractions. The other thing, and now I'm kind of moving along with parent empowerment due to time, the other thing we need to think about is the role of the parent and what they could take on. So they're a master uh, designer, right? And they're gonna help design the learning environment. And they may take a Saturday to do it. We give them a bunch of ideas. We may do a video model. We may take some pictures and they do that in the home environment. Another thing they could be doing is helping with the exercise. Exercise we know is gonna help uh, improve attention. It's gonna reduce distractions. It's gonna improve energy. It's going to, to uh, reduce stress and anxiety. It helps develop confidence. The, the list of things goes on. So we may not ask them to be the PE instructor, but rather help them with ideas to facilitate exercise that will then lead to these types of opportunities. So for example, it could be a collection of video channels, um, what is it, Moosley, and other things like that that the students might like. It could be connecting in a suggestion in our, our, our week's work Hey, here are some things to bring on. Here are some exercises to suggest. It might be using Zoom as part, everyone stand up, everyone do the following, we're gonna do the following. You know, it might, be, it might be sending home scarves where people do different exercises with scarves to cross the midline. Crossing the midline is awesome for memory and getting ready to learn. So it could be a host of things like that that help facilitate uh, that exercise. Now, of course, when I think video and I think of exercise, I'm sorry, but I'm going to go back to the uh, 80s and 90s. Oops. And uh, go back to our Richard Simmons here. Okay. Okay. Come on, you're going to move with me. There he is. Yes. Richard Simmons. Okay, we'll just leave that there. But there's a lot of different ways we can facilitate uh, that activity that's gonna help with that level of engagement. Uh, there's different roles we as educators can facilitate in developing steps, identifying games, uh, offering tips and strategies that then the home environment could potentially facilitate. But you know, we can do this collectively as a group. One of the things that I love and I urge you to consider, especially as a, as a, as a collaborative community building exercise engagement is the Marathon Club. Now, for those of us that know about the Marathon Club, when it's been done face-to-face, -face, it's often an elementary middle school experience where in the morning prior to school or maybe one afternoon where there's maybe a, a time that would work, uh, they're on site for maybe 45 minutes, 30 minutes, the children walk a certain uh, amount, they walk a route, and they do a distance. And then that distance is recorded on a daily basis. So over the course of a series of weeks, if not a series of months, they continue to exercise and they're moving towards that 26.2. Now, most students, if not everyone, will be able to complete that by the end of the academic year. So they'll have a marathon done. They could walk it, they could run it. Now, if we're all remote, or if we wanna do that remote, we could do that with, we could offer as educators, here's a map of various places in our community, be it the park, be it the trail, it might be if we're fully online around the school building where here's a suggested map that would be a quarter of a mile or a half a mile. And here's how much time we'd suggest doing it. So that's the type of thing where the child may go out with a group of children, all socially distanced, and they could potentially do that. They could record it on an app or we could create a Google Sheets in the Google Classroom where you record it. And then of course, when you complete it, you recognize for that, it could be part of your hybrid learning or your fully online learning. Generally, they get a t-shirt saying marathon completer. And by the way, you can change the colors if they complete two marathons or three marathons during the year. So it's a great way to facilitate that collaboration, that building. And of course, all this is to enhance engagement because of the exercise. So a list of different things you can do here. So just a, 
just as a consideration. Okay, so just as an idea. Now, with that said, one last thing I want to share, and, and then there's a list of things I'm not going to, be able to get to, is let's talk about some technology. So some technology we can use in the area of engagement focuses on this building of collaboration. And so one tool I want to share with you is Padlet. And Padlet, and feel free to pop on uh, in the last group, a number of people popped on with me, and this was awesome, okay? And so they all jumped on, so this is great. I should have turned a, a new Padlet on, I apologize. But there's this little pink area here, you click on it, and what it does, and I apologize for all these di different distractions here, your, your colleagues created something last time, but I can type in anything I want. Okay, and Padlet allows everyone, and feel free folks to click on this. This is on slide, um, what slide am I on? Uh, slide, um, uh, shoot, just a second. I'm on slide 51. So on slide 51, there's a link to the Padlet, so feel free to join me over there. And what Padlet allows me to do is I can type in anything I want, and then, oh, and people are starting to pop in, that's awesome. I can take a picture. So here's my camera. And here we go, three, two, one. There we go, take a picture of me doing that. And that's gonna pop up. And I'm already noticing people are starting to update, which is awesome, so thank you for jumping in. But the neat thing about Padlet is I could put in images, I could put in text, but the beauty of this is you can all do it together. So I'm gonna do a refresh because people have been updating. And let's see what people have been doing to update. This is all, this could be done collaboratively and live. So I could be on synchronously. I don't need to be chatting. I don't need to be on the phone. But I, as an instructor, gave you directions and identified a small group. And then together, you folks are creating whatever I've asked you to do in a Padlet. And by the way, you can have your own Padlet. So I could assign a group of five people their own link. And so it's not as messy and crazy as you're seeing right now. And I know you're like, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming. A lot of things are going on here. But the beauty of this is I could do this synchronously, real time, but also I could come on, add my component, someone else can come on, add their component, et cetera, et cetera. Some type of thing we could do in Google Slide, Google Docs, but also I can do in Padlet. But another area I can do this in is a tool called Explain Everything. Now Explain Everything is also a tool, it's an app, it's a website, and it allows me to, and let me pop over here, this is something I started with our group last time, but it allows me to take a pencil here, and it allows me to, uh, let's just write my name. Oops, uh, my handwriting stinks and my drawing stinks as well. I can write my name. I could, well, I could erase it if I wanted to, so I could go up here, and get my eraser, get my big eraser, and I'm gonna just erase this part here because I made a mistake, okay? I can add in images, and this is a picture I just downloaded and added here. I can highlight elements here, as you saw from my yellow here. So there's a lot of different tools. There's my shape tool. I can add in shapes and all sorts of different things. So this is something that's available as an app, but also as a website, explain everything. But how is it collaborative, Sean? Well, up here, there's a C, CSPV, et cetera. I can invite people with that code, and then by the, their invitation, they could come on and at the same time, or whenever they choose, be adding in their other elements. And so therefore, collaboratively, we could be interacting with several interactive pages on this interactive whiteboard, because it's just not one, we could add pages in as well. But the beauty of this is besides everything I've shared with you very simplistically, and I apologize for the time, but also the fact that I could share this, but I can record it. I can record the audio, I can record the video. So we could be talking through this at our different devices, offering commentary, recording this, and when it's done, we could then save it and share it with the instructor. So not only do they see what we collaborated on and created, but they can hear our narration and see the steps we took. Now, again, this could be a math problem we're working out collaboratively. This could be a number of different things. This is where you need to contextualize it within your need. The tool itself, as well as Paddle and others, allow folks to get online and do things collaboratively. High way to engage folks. Okay, it looks like folks are joining me. Thank you. Folks are joining in, even without my invitation, uh, because I'm giving you the code. So. 
Um, I've run out of time. Um, this part of this presentation also lists, and I'll just sh share with you number one, 10 other ideas, 10 kind of basic engagement tips, and then tied to technology. And I'll give you an illustration of this first one, then we'll call it a day. But uh, in terms of this one, there's a little Kermit the Frog. Well, getting to know your students, something I use is this PowerPoint. And this is sitting in our Google folder for today. And inside there, I've created this PowerPoint that basically illustrates out what I'd like folks to complete. So I put in my generic stuff, and then they're gonna type in, they're gonna replace it with their information, including their own picture. And then we share this with everybody. Actually, they convert the PowerPoint into a Google slide. And then they share it with everybody. And that way we get to know each other. We get to get connected with each other. I love looking at my question about what's your favorite movie. And this is something that people can come back to throughout the time to be reminded, especially if they're fully online, who some of our peers are. I see you on Zoom, but I don't exactly know who you are at the level I'd like to. Here you go. Now, by the way, this is just one example. There's lots of different needs assessments you can create about learning styles, interests, things of that nature. That would be great illustrations for you to get to know your students, your students to get to know each other, to further engage, collaborate, et cetera. All right, so a minute over, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and allow kind of Sarah to take it from there. I hope I've offered you some good connections and gotten you thinking about ways to engage, not just simply by digital tools. But as I leave here, I do wanna reinforce, I do have a number of digital tools linked off a resource under the Google uh, folder for engagement, if that helps.